Hello, my name is Angela Clark. Welcome to our introduction to sculpture panel is uh, sculpture impervious to time and tide. And thank you, the event is going to be an hour and 15 minutes. We'll have our six speakers and then we will follow by questions. My name is Angela Clark. I'm the museum director and curator at the Italian Cultural Center Gallery, otherwise known as Il Museo. The year of 2021 was the 150th year since the birth of the Italian Canadian sculptor, Charles Morega. He was born on September 24th, 1871 and died in March of 1939. In honor of his anniversary, the ICC Gallery embarked on a year-long project where we focused on the achievements of Morega, his artistic and cultural contribution to Vancouver, and especially his formative influence on organizations with which he had a hand in establishing and continue to thrive today such as the Department of Sculpture at Emily Carr, formerly known as the Vancouver School of Art. At the art school, he was the first sculptor instructor in the 20s until his death in March of 39. He also helped establish the Sculptor Society of BC, the SSBC. As this celebration year progressed throughout each of the four exhibitions, challenges arose. While there was an acknowledgement of Morega's immense contributions, the lions on the bridge, the Captain Vancouver sculpture, the facades at the UBC library, and even the touching Pauline Johnson death mask, there were also many uncomfortable aspects arising from his legacy that needed to be reconciled with his contribution. For example, the lions on the bridge do not represent the innate landscape and wildlife of BC, but rather they are interpreted as a monumental symbol of British colonial authority and see the lions on the bridge and the images I have here. Second, Morega himself possessed notions of public art that were diametrically opposed to our current concepts. He stated that sculpture must remain the builder's craft and the corporate life of towns and cities demands this. In his notion, sculpture should reinforce the values and status quo or the prevailing corporate culture of the city. Sculpture in his estimation did not seek to challenge current and outmoded social structures, but rather reinforce the social hierarchy. Finally, Morego was a proponent of the Beaux-Arts movement, a European art and design movement from 1830 to 1914, which was characterized by classical sculpture, embodying highly sexualized images of women, serving as representations of abstract allegorical notions. In Morega's time, women were rarely represented as actively engaged public figures who spearheaded social movements, unless, of course, they were a British monarch. Out of this dual assessment of Morega's legacy and the general questioning of the role of public art itself in our current culture, the idea of a panel discussion on public art arose as well ongoing conversations with artists engaged in the Morega anniversary year evolved into a desire for a panel discussion. In support of this project, we were fortunate to obtain funding through BC Multiculturalism through the 150th Inquiry Stream to support the creation of this event. We also ca called upon a team of specialists to engage in the discussion. Each speaker was selected for their important perspective on public sculpture based on their professional and cultural background and experiential insights. The first speaker is Erin Nelson Moody, First Nation sculptor of the Squamish Nation, working in Coast Salish tradition. Next, Ruth Beer, artist and professor of art, sculpture, and expanded practice from Emily Carr University. Third, Eric Friedrichsen, Head of Public Art, Cultural Services, City of Vancouver. Fourth, Beth Alber, Artist Designer, Marker of Change, the Women's Monument, Vancouver, and Professor Emeritus, Ontario College of Art and Design. Five, Barry Mowat, Founder and Artistic Director of the Vancouver Biennale 
and his colleague Amar Mahamwala, Vancouver Biennale Special Projects Advisor. The panel will offer six vantage points from which to contemplate the role, necessity, and voices which must be represented within public sculpture. These are fundamentally the choices facing the city of Vancouver when assessing the place public sculpture has in the life of our city. Topics addressed in this panel will not only include the relevance of public sculpture, but also how, if it is to remain relevant, it must be more inclusive, representing voices of the underrepresented, especially women, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, which will result in a change in the role and aesthetic paradigms of public art. Each speaker and panelist will just talk for seven minutes. There will be time for a few questions at the end, and I will present the closing remarks after the questions. The full length of this event is 75 minutes. We will begin with Aaron Nelson Moody. Aaron Nelson Moody, Squamish Carver, sculptor, working in the Salish, Coast Salish tradition. Thank you. Aaron? Hot squirrel to know CM CI, uh, Nate Quinn talks in your quality and snow, um, uh, Osami up, uh, uh, Chin Quinn Tommy, uh, Osami up. Um, in English, my name is Aaron Nelson Moody. Uh, I come from the Squamish Nation, a place called Chiakamas, which is in, uh, in, uh, northern, northern Squamish. And, uh, th thank you for the invitation. Thank you for remembering, uh, one of our, one of our host nations to speak tonight. Yeah, the, I, you know, I tend to love looking at sculpture and uh, growing up, I didn't really understand what it all represented. I never knew why we had lions on our bridge. Um, and it was only when I went to England that I saw the lions at Trafalgar Square that I realized that um, someone interpreted our art history very differently and put those lions, uh, you know, in the middle of our territory. I live right underneath this bridge. I'm here at Hamultrison, so it's right, it's right overhead when, where I live. Um, would you be able to show some of those uh, images I have, the Canoe family? Yes. All right. So I'm going to bounce around from these uh, off of these images, but uh, in, in particular, this this is one um, I, I I really appreciate because it shows the very direct nature of uh, of teaching in our communities. And uh, I don't know if that child is the child of those two people in the canoe, or if it's just someone they're learning from. Um, it, it shows a bunch of different technologies in there, but. In particular, it shows the very direct uh, transfer of knowledge, which is something that we um, we value highly. So, in in this, um, I don't know if it's just historic, but uh, historically, we we lived in smaller communities, and when we did a public work, everyone knew what it was. Everyone was everyone participated. Everyone was a, a witness, um, you know, as it was being you know created and um, as it was being put up. Everyone had a everyone had a say in it. And I doubt they all agreed, but everyone participated. Um, in, in today's world, it's a little different. Um, you know, there's there's more people here, and there's you know uh, there's no space between us in some ways. So uh, our communities are all kind of mashed together in a way that we're we're expected to all agree with each other, which wasn't the case here historically. Uh, can you show the maybe the next image there? Sorry, we can just go to the next image. Yeah, so we. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that that that's, that in particular is very significant. Um, we we do public art in our, my community on behalf of community with involvement of community, and at the end of it, we we lay a we lay a piece at at the community's feet, and if they if they think it represents them, they'll pick it up, and and place it in their house or or you know or or, or raise it in the dirt. Um, so there's that moment of transference, and it's it's very very clear that the community has every right to. To, to say no at that point. And they also acknowledge the lifespan of the pieces we carved, whether it was in stone or metal or wood, uh, everything has a lifespan and we wouldn't try to preserve something for all time. We tried to preserve the tradition for all time. In order to do that, everyone everyone had to participate. Uh, like that first image that like we had to train, we had to train the youth, um, we had to involve the community for, for any big work. Um, fairly recently. Uh, what image would you like next? Uh, uh, can you go two, four, two ahead? The, the image with the and one more. Yeah, the, so this is a, a colleague and I wrote a, an article about the potlatch's methodology. 
um, not to try to pinpoint the only things that happened at a potlatch because uh, everyone would have a different experience. But we, we looked at a weaving and thought there's sort of a, um, an underlying structure, if you will, that acknowledges local territory. And that's the theme that runs through every, every Indigenous uh, people I've ever met, uh, not just here, but in other parts of the world, acknowledging the house of the people you know, you're in. And we sort of represented that with the red uprights of the, of the weaving diagram. And for each institution or each group or each community, which is unique and it's made up of very unique blend of cultures, um, the sideways, the, the sideways part of the weaving represents a very unique design that's built, built on that structure. So it's very collaborative. We were using this as a model for when we develop programs and um, made sure everyone was welcome, made sure everyone was fed and um, involved everyone in the work. And the part where it says reflect, that's what I'm talking about, witnesses. Everyone had a chance to speak about something. We would get to see many different perspectives from many different families and cultures even. Uh, I guess like the panel tonight. Uh, can you go, sorry, can you go next one, please? One of the, the totem pole. So um, my mentor, Halakton, is on the panel at the Audain Museum in Whistler. And uh, a Jim Hart piece was going up. And um, my mentor was saying, there's a lot of pieces that go up in our territory, and sometimes, um, sometimes people ask us about it before they put up their pieces, and sometimes they don't. I believe that Jim Hart, who carved this piece, uh, has always been very respectful um, when he when he works on our territory. But for the general public, they they don't quite understand whose territory they're on sometimes. So they, they you know they literally say things like the Squamish must be dead or the Slave to are all must would say the Slave to are all gone now or have no idea who the Musqueam people are. So in this case, Halakton wanted to um, make sure that we acknowledged that this was done in a good way. So Jim Hart put his piece up on uh, shared Squamish Lilla territory, but Halakton worked with some youth to create a base, um, kind of like what Angela George would say, like laying blankets before a ceremony so that everyone understands it's been done in a good way. So I think this is a really, um, really interesting uh, model for what can happen in collaboration and to have a, a very visual cue as to um, how people are doing their work. Angela George and I just recently worked on a, a sound wall installation in North Vancouver. And um, in particular, we were happy to collaborate what I think in English you might call gendered art forms, um, the weaving tradition and the carving or painting traditions. We, we were able to collaborate in a piece that we were quite, quite proud of. Uh, that's, the, that's the last image I'm talking about. And um, in, in a lot of ways, the men's work has been, uh, has overshadowed in recent years, the really strong traditions of women's work. So we're kind of glad that we're able to um, combine them in this case and show that they're very, very strong uh, collaboration and uh, mutual respect. Uh, we're quite proud of the piece. And um, we, we tried our best to involve the general public with images they might recognize as well. I think might be running out of time. No, uh, yeah, so, one minute. Uh, oh, so uh, I guess the, <laughs> my answer to the question is, um, I don't, I don't think things should should last forever um, in terms of the actual objects. Um, you know, I can't couldn't help but thinking of that Ozymandias poem. Um, you know, of course things go back into the world, and we we've never tried to stop that, but um, we want our traditions to last forever. But we don't want to do things in the same old way we've always done as new people join our community, we get new teachings. Um, we, we, learn, we learn from everyone who connects with our community. And I think that's, uh, I think that's good. We had a, a cultural protocol around innovation in our community. So um, we weren't overwhelmed by change. We were thoughtful about it. And we asked people to uh, do kind of a critical analysis when we, when we added new things in our community like guns or, or motors for our boats. Um, and I, I believe that tradition is uh, worth remembering. I think it's worth reenacting. Um, and my, my mentor in that case, I think he did a very good job of um, balancing our need to be hospitable to all the people who come to our territory, but not being washed, washed off the face of the earth by, by, by other people and other, spe other people's value of who we are as Squamish people. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you so much. And our next speaker is Ruth Beer, artist and professor, faculty of art, Sculpture and expand, Expanded Practice, Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Thank you. 
and uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, sorry, I think I'll stop sharing for a minute. It'll take me a minute to get this organized, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Sorry about this. Okay. Can we see this? Is yes. does everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you to the people who have taken their time uh, before their dinner to, to join us here today. Um, uh, I, I wanna say uh, that I'm uh, coming to you from the Emily Carr University where I am right now, uh, the uh, unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people and I'm grateful to be on this land. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, public art that I've been involved with for about the last 15 years. And I'll give you uh, examples of various um, works that I've produced and uh, some of the underlying ideas that come with it. All projects require attention to the context and purpose. Uh, when these commissions or uh, projects come, uh, for a public space specifically rather than an exhibition space in a gallery, um, but more in the community. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge text, context, purpose, and acknowledge and be sensitive to place, which is the historical, social, and architectural context, space, the surrounding textures, colors, forms, people, and how people can interact and uh, and how it, how the piece can be viewed and and uh, and and uh, and uh, be a, be an active uh, element in the, in the community. Important considerations uh, for me as an artist, besides these points that I'm, I'm making, is that that it that the work should be safe. Uh, safety is a big factor because uh, you want to be sure that that whatever occurs, especially large scale works, um, don't invite any kind of problem in that way. And the uh, excitement is in the possibilities and constraints of thinking about projects in relation to the materials, fabrication, and the budget that would allow these works to emerge. Um, I've done various kinds of works and some are short-term installations. So here's one at Beijing University that involved myself and colleagues um, where we introduced, or we sorry, interviewed um, immigrants to Canada, specifically to Richmond, um, and to speak about their lives as uh, and their journey in feeling belonging to the community. And we were invited to put this piece up and um, it was uh, meant to be in place for several months. And interestingly, after one day, we were told we had to remove it. And the controversy on this is that, um, uh, th that the images were um, perhaps not the celebratory uh, as was expected, that they showed everyday life, uh, uh, both some of the challenges and uh, and uh, and uh, and and uh, wonderful aspects of life in Canada. But in any case, it was felt to be uh, not suitable. This is another work that was temporary bus shelters in Richmond. Um, we we took the phrase "You are here." We repeated it in numerous languages that occur in Richmond. And we showed images of that were sort of typical of Richmond, that is uh, our area, the canneries, the uh, Buddhist temple, the waterways, etc. Another temporary work, this was done for um, the Olympics. We were asked by Christchurch Cathedral to create a work uh, where people could come during the Olympics and find repose. So this is the work here. It's made with the organ pipes that used to be in the cathedral that one of the um, members of the church had in his uh, 
barn in Salt Spring Island. We took it, we, we cleaned them and uh, uh, placed them. The piece is called Silent Song. Longer term projects include uh, this work. Again, you are here. And um, the references to the landscape. Many of the references that, that inspire me have to do with the land, with the history of the land, the use of the land. And in this case, uh, this patio or this uh, uh, area um, in North Vancouver is a very much, is, uh, is part of the, the uh, bike route that goes from the upper levels down towards the water. And this is an area I conceived of as a place that not only suggested twists and turns, but also some of the geology and a place for people to rest. Um, another piece in Richmond, uh, this area where this piece was placed was an orchard, and it's a kind of monument to what was there before, the tree and the fruit. Um, a piece at the South Surrey Recreational Arts Centre uh, that was thought of as being uh, something that was joyous, that suggests sport, and especially gymnastics, um, that had uh, here's an image, especially of the this uh, gymnast with the ribbon dance, um, the First Nations people in the area, and there were colors that we adapted from those costumes that were worn. Um, it's a piece that's very popular. People come, they sit on it, uh, they take pictures around it. Um, and finally, a piece called Current at the city of Burnaby. Ideas of weaving are very important to me. And uh, I think of this as the vertical and horizontal warp and weft of weaving. And um, thinking about the circularity uh, movement of uh, waterways around Burnaby, uh, material interests, basketry. Um, and uh, this is shows some of the process um, some of the ways that as a public artist, uh, one has to translate their ideas digitally and in um, maquettes. Here's the piece. Um, you can see some of the verticals that are repeated in the building design itself so that it, 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 uh, it acknowledged that, the architecture. Um, and these pieces are stainless steel, aluminum, powder coated. Um, I'm bringing you closer and closer to some of the uh, reflections that could be seen. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Eric Friedrichsen, Head of Public Art, Cultural Services, City of Vancouver. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, thanks to everybody on this panel. It's great to, to be amongst you tonight. Um, I was asked to focus on uh, the city's commemoration policy, which is something that hasn't really existed in a very developed form through the whole history of the city for as much commemoration as happened there. And it's something that we've been tasked with, um, with creating a formal policy around. Um, I won't get you too much into the policy details, but just to say that we're, we're quite a bit at the beginning of the process. We've been doing research and internal work on this and we have yet to launch it publicly. Um, we are, We've scheduled some upcoming conversations with staff at, at the host at um, the Musqueam and Squamish and tsleil -Waututh Nations that will um, kind of be the first point of, of public contact with the work. And then it'll start to emerge in, into more uh, broader public consultation. And you should expect to see a lot more about the policy emerge after the election with the new council seated when, when public engagement can really get going again at the city. Um, so 2023 will be a really key time for this work. But um, I can give some context to just how commemoration has worked in the city and, and the current state of play, um, some um, works that have been in the news recently and so on. Um, starting with uh, my first image, um, which is a page from the province newspaper. And um, I wanna thank Ruth for, for, um, for giving a territorial acknowledgement. I think it's really key when we talk about commemoration to recognize, and when we do acknowledgements at the city, to recognize that a lot of the history of the city has been in a denial of, of that exact uh, fact of, of the unceded territory that the city was founded on. 
And so um, this is a perspective, uh, a, a, a rendering of an attempt um, by white settlers to create within Stanley Park an evocation of an indigenous village. And for those of you who know um, forms of, of British Columbia and the Northwest generally, you'll recognize that Stanley Park, which was a site of great significance to the local nations um, and as part of the founding of the city and its park system, um, their traditional uses and habitation within within the park was was um, was destroyed. That it's interesting that one of the first moves was then to replace that actual living cultural presence with um, with images of works that that are not local to to Vancouver. These are our Haida or Kwakwakwak poles and the longhouse form with the the double um, with the gabled ends and and the the um, the peaked roof rather than a, a single um, slant roof is, is also not a local architectural form. And so the city has often tried to profit from an image of itself as being, um, as having a strong indigenous heritage, but it's often been through a, a fabrication and, a, and an importation of, of those forms. Um, if we go to the next image, um, just to jump ahead to just a couple of years ago, as we all know, as the, the city and, and the world started to shut down at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the, the various um, comings together and uprisings and protests that uh, expanded across the globe really, um, had had local valences in, in response to specific um, colonial sculptures within the city. So this is an image of graffiti fighters who have a contract with the city to maintain um, aspects of our commemorative landscape, cleaning uh, red paint off of the statue of, of Captain George Vancouver that stands on the steps of City Hall. And um, I like this image partly because I think we're, when we're talking about commemoration, we're talking about existing works and, and how to contextualize them or think about them, how to, how to re-engage with them. Um, and then we're talking about new commemoration, how how the city can um, put itself in a position to adjudicate and, and to welcome new forms of commemoration into the city landscape. But maintenance is itself a form of, of how the city shows its values. Um, and so as soon as red paint is, is put on a, a, a statue, I don't even get a call. There's a call directly to the graffiti fighters and they, they spray it off. The next image, I think, will be, I, I think I misnumbered a little bit, but um, yeah. So Gassy Jack around the same time, the sculpture by Vern Simpson that sits in Maple Tree Square and Gastown was also hit by red paint. And before I could get down there on my bike to, to check it out for myself, again, it was being cleaned off. And it was only this image by a lo uh, sent to us by a local um, security person working, I think for the BIA that showed me that there was a specific content to this, to this message that it wasn't just, um, the red paint, it was this sign at the base of it, which reads M-M-I-W-G. And so Gassy Jack has become a, a significant figure to be as a figure of protest because of the knowledge that his second wife, Kalia, who was Squamish, was only 12 years old when he married her. And so connecting that through this activism to contemporary um, okay. issues around indigenous women and girls and two-spirited, Yes. Books, um, was really key to, to, to have that exact message in mind. So in this case, uh, while we don't have a commemoration policy in place and we don't have a practiced method for considering questions around contested uh, monuments, um, we were able, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, through conversations with Squamish Nation who asked the city to stand back and let them consider with Kalia's descendants what should happen next, we were able to start to think about what a new framework could be where the city doesn't take sole control over the public landscape, but works in, um, in something closer to right relations with the, the, the nations. Um, so that's ongoing and we will we'll be engaging more about, about the, the future of Gassy Jack and what will happen there. This image is distorted, but and it's a little out of order, sorry, but yeah, this is good. I just wanted to point to, in a, as a counterpoint to the image of uh, of the fake uh, longhouses in Stanley Park, this image, which is one of the three gateways uh, comprised of house posts that Susan Point created for Brockton Point, where which is the, the city's prime location for collecting Kwakwakwak and, and Haida totem poles. And this was a work that came out of storytelling work that uh, my colleague Kamala Todd 
um, did in relation to trying to trying to uncover some indigenous histories and stories of these lands. But it was a way of, of marking and welcoming um, by, by in reference to the local nations at a, at a place where the city had primarily represented its in, indigenous heritage through imported forms again. And then my last image is a bit of a wild card in, in the context of what I've been talking about, but I think it's important that we continue to work with artists directly as we think about commemoration and its future. And this example is a work by Paul Wong that was an artist initiated project. He was doing a long-term residency at Sun Yat Sen Gardens, and he proposed to erect a sign in a laneway in Chinatown that's actually a former site of Vancouver City Hall. So a site where many of the acts of, of formal discrimination against Chinese Canadians were signed into law is now marked with a different form of sign that indicates two names used um, by Chinese immigrant settlers for Vancouver. One of them is a phonetic representation of sounds similar to ban, ku, wa, uh, and the, the three other ones represent uh, an informal name for the city, which is Saltwater City. And so by inserting this in a language uh, that, is, that is true to the people who are living in this, in this neighborhood for, for over a century, um, but, but I think it's, it's significant that it isn't something that was commissioned by the city for a specific purpose. It also came out of an artist's direct engagement with the site and the place. And so I think it's going to be important as we think about commemoration to balance real engagement with communities, real um, giving lead to, to the host nations with uh, the direct role that artists can play in finding new forms of, of commemoration for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Beth Alper, artist, designer, marker of change, the Women's Monument, Professor Emeritus from OCAD University. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a story about the Women's Monument and how it all began. As a student myself in 1993, finishing up the third of four semesters of a graduate degree at NASCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I saw a call for entry on the notice board to submit a design to a national design competition for a women's monument in Vancouver to mark the murder of 14 engineering students on December 6, 1989 at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. No more details, but I was curious and intrigued. My time at NASCAD was a break and, and sabbatical from my work as professor at OCAD University in Toronto, where at that time I taught jewelry design and the Montreal massacre was a watershed moment for me as a teacher and a woman who suddenly realized how vulnerable we were to such violence. It could have been us. December 7th, I had a studio class with senior industrial design students, both men and women, and we were all shaken, saddened, and outraged. I remember particularly how confused and ashamed the men felt mostly just about being men and how they wanted to work towards this never happening again. We were all just beginning to realize the profound effect the actions of the night before were having on our lives and those feelings stayed with me when I applied to NASCAD in 1991. Chris, could you put up the images? Yes. The first one, that, thank you. After seeing the um, call for entry in 1993, I left Halifax with a friend in, uh, to visit a friend in New Brunswick. On that drive, the complete design for the proposal came to me. A bench for each fallen woman. Benches were what we normally associate with parks. These benches would be more than just benches. Pink granite from Quebec. Granite, because it is forever and what Canada is built on. Respect for the park and all who use it. The circle, a continuum, space to accent the importance of the individual and the loss, opportunity for community gatherings and contemplation. It was quite a drive. 
Next image, Chris. Seeing this at the uh, plant where the project was fabricated was oh, a... no. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. No. And, um, Andrea, can you shut off the uh, mic? Thanks. Okay, go go ahead, Beth. Uh, it was a this was a heart stopping moment. Fabrication took place in the plant at Rock of Ages, Stansted, Quebec. They donated the granite and fabrication and allowed me to work in the plant. The granite forms are five and a half feet in length, 24 inches wide and 12 inches deep and was quarried in Northern Quebec. Visually, each slab resembles a normal park setting, a, a normal park bench sitting 18 inches off the ground, but it is also reminiscent of a sarcophagus. Each bench was treated individually. The yoni shape was treated much like a painter would approach their canvas and create the vision. In this case, it was to allow for a collection of water or a pool of tears. Next image. Here we are at Thornton Park in Vancouver, the construction site. Next image. The site was carefully engineered to account for future earthquakes by creating footings for each bench and the circle of donors. The forms are positioned equally around the 100, diameter, 100 foot diameter circle, emphasizing the importance of the individual woman. Each individual woman is recognized for themselves and the potential that was taken away from them, from us as a country and their families and friends. The 14 feet empty space created between each bench is an art and design tool used to emphasize the power and significance of the individual and the vulnerability of that lone space. Next image. Another major element of the project was the circle of donors. Visually, this ring of tiles created a framework or protection for the circle of bench forms, but also recognized the more than 6,000 donors to the project from across Canada and beyond. The donors Two minutes. were made up of individuals, families, groups, and was privately sponsored. These tiles were handcrafted at the Sumas Clay Company, Abbotsford, an indigenous brick making manufacturer. Each name was letter punched into the leather hard clay before firing and all in alphabetical order. A logistical nightmare to say the least. Next image. The dedication you see here, I don't know if you can read this or not. Um, dedication you see here was translated into seven different languages relevant to our Canadian multicultural society. English, French, Chinook, Jargon, Chinese, Spanish, Swahili, and Hindi. The dedication was written and sweated over by the amazing group of volunteers called the Women's Monument Committee who worked on the details of the controversial dedication and languages and at least a million other things. They were always there and focused on the end result. Next image. Thornton Park, December 6th, 1997. The project was officially unveiled and the event was very well attended by the community, officials, family members, and volunteers who had worked on the project for eight years from 1989 to the completion in 1997. It was a bittersweet day and ceremony, but was seen as an opportunity to recognize the larger community and pay homage to all women who had suffered from violence. Uh, I think my time is probably yes, up. Yes, wrap up, 
Thank you. And uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, Barry Mowat, founder, president, and artistic director of the Vancouver Biennale, and Amar Mahamwala, the, also the Vancouver Biennale Special Projects Advisor. Thank you, everyone. And, and actually, thank, I thank you for uh, inviting me. And uh, it's wonderful to be a part of this uh, uh, August group of uh, almost historic uh, Vancouverites and Canadians. Uh, I'm going to uh, just do a lead in here. Basically what you're going to see more presenting is a reflection of what is sculpture in keeping with the theme of uh, that was presented to us. And you'll see images of past 24 years where it's been a process of continuously reimagining ourselves uh, and to remain relevant and how, what public sculpture is and how public sculpture has transitioned uh, uh, just in that short time for us in the Biennale and uh, within the city. So Amar has been with me, was with me for five years. He now works in Victoria and in uh, culture planning and space. And I'll let him tell you a bit more, but so thank you for that. And I hope you enjoy the, uh, the historical review. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, would you mind bringing up the, the first image? And just before I started, yeah, my name is Amar Mahimala. Thank you for, for the invitation to be here. I just wanna acknowledge that I'm on the traditional homelands of the Lekwungen people that we know today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And I'm truly blessed for the stewardship of the land and the opportunity to live and be a part of their community. So yeah, kind of as Barry was, was mentioning that we're just looking at a selection of images that the Biennale has put out there in the public realm over the past 24 years. And really some of these are, are they're not chronologically ordered. So they're kind of, idiosyncratic in that sense, but really looking at it from thematically where in the early years, the emphasis was really on celebrating diversity and bringing the world to Vancouver where showcasing artists from across the world, from the US on the top right, we have Dennis Oppenheim. In the center image, we have Jaume Plenza, the Spanish artist. At the top left, we have Bill Reed, who's, who's local to some relevance context in BC. At the bottom left, we have Magdalena Abakanowicz from Poland. In this bottom center image, there's Ai Weiwei with F. Cross, and he's Chinese dissident artist. And the bottom right has Jack Harmon, whose work was recently reinstalled just on Granville Island there. So that was kind of the early years or a lot of the historic context for the Biennale. It was just celebrating diversity through public art and showcasing different cultures and artistic forms. If you could move to the next image, please. Over the years as well, kind of doing public art, just then really digging into another layer of meaning is actually placemaking and, and picking sites very intentionally and specifically that had cultural and social and community meaning. So here we have some images in the top left, it's Trans Am Totem by Marcus Pocot, a North Vancouver based artist who taught at Capilano University for 25 years. And the site is really interesting because it's where the viaducts end or start and Vancouver, as we know, was kind of transformed by that historic moment of activism by several underrepresented and underprivileged communities, you know, and, and that's what's affected our geography and our topography in the urban landscape today as we know it. You know, we're not a car city because of those, that moment in time. And this place kind of marks that. The top right image really um, is by Vic Muniz, and it's a land art installation piece that was created out in Squamish, the, the town of Squamish just by the waterfront on the industrial harbor lands. And the image of a wolf, again, when Vic Muniz was working with local artists in the local Squamish nation, he was talking to chief and elders and, and he wanted to kind of represent a visual identity of their culture. And they, they recommended, or they kind of encouraged him to look at the wolf because it's a social animal. They hunt in packs, they live in extended families. And that really would represent, you know, the values of community and. For, for the Squamish community. The, the bottom right image really is um, while New Westminster, it's a 140 foot long installation that was sadly destroyed by fire recently, or actually a few years ago now, COVID times. And it sits out and it used to sit out in New Westminster Pier Park on the waterfront. And again, it marks that transformation of industrial working waterfront lands in Metro Vancouver, which are now becoming residential and highly urbanized in a different form. The bottom left image is um, 
the concrete silos on Granville Island at Ocean Concrete. And again, this, this marks this interesting space where, which was again, very industrial and very much kind of working waterfront lands that was transformed into now an arts and culture hub with Emily Carr University that was there until very recently and the public market and a whole host of other arts and culture spaces. But transforming this, these concrete silos through spray paint, again, not a typical sculptural material, but bringing that kind of dimension with Brazilian artist Os Gemios to the city to do their largest work. And it's actually 360 degrees. So it does have that sculptural element to it where they were interacting with a different material that they didn't work with before. The next image, please. Yeah, and sort of more recently, the, the emphasis has shifted from the materiality and the site context to really communities and, and bringing people together in a local context. And, and definitely a kind of a big gap was working with indigenous host nations, the Musqueam, the Squamish. And the Two Squamish. minutes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that top left image really showcases um, weaving cultural identities, threads through time, which is a weaving project that brought together six indigenous um, matriarchs from each of the three nations, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Slavertooth, to create a 40 foot wide prayer rug, essentially to frame the sculptural installation, which is a mosque by a Saudi Arabian artist. So it was again, kind of showcasing different cultural identities, but using different materiality. And this, the, the artwork itself was kind of located on um, Sanak that we know it now as, which was a historic site as well of a village settlement in Kitsilano. The top right image is um, community gardens by a residency artist where she was inspired by Martin Luther King's um, speech if I have a dream and talking about land rights and talking about farmer rights across the world, planting community gardens, harvesting food and sharing meals. The bottom left image is just a performance piece by a South Asian artist from India to commemorate and document the Komagata Maru, which in 1914 denied entry to 376 South Asian, primarily Indian immigrants into Vancouver. And just the bottom right image to, to round it off is an AR and a VR installation underneath Camby Street Bridge by a Colombian American artist, Jessica Angel. And as we move into the digital space, what is sculpture, what is public space? And these kind of opportunities would help bring in new communities, younger generations into the discussion of public art. And Barry Mollick, do you have your, uh, you've come to the 40, 46 to seven minute point to you. Can you wrap up? Why you go ahead and wrap up please. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's just about it. That's okay. Timing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amar. Uh, Barry Mowit. Yes. Are you speaking now? <laughs> no, no. Amar, Amar, Amar did, this, did the talking for us. That was our seven minutes. Basically, I wanted to just summarize and say uh, what we're talking about is how sculptors to, it was, earlier question was that sculpture, how does sculpture stand the test of time? Uh, and one piece you saw there was the uh, Jack Harmon family work it was, was installed uh, 50 years ago. And then at the Pacific Press building it was deinstalled uh, subsequently and 30 years later now, uh, it has been re has reemerged uh, and installed in a new public setting. Uh, but what's interesting about this, how that work has changed in terms of interpretation, it was about the family. So it opens all kinds of opportunities from a historical perspective, the difference between the family of 1972 and the family of 2022, uh, and those kind of discussions that can occur. So public art, I think is really crucial in terms of how it reflects the community, how it can transition neighborhoods, bringing people together uh, in dialogue, not always positively, but certainly in terms of the aspect of, of community. And our engagement with uh, First Nations uh, in the last uh, four to five years has been really significant in terms of helping us uh, come together and understanding some of the history of, of the land in which we uh, live and which we play. So I'm very pleased that in that transition over the last 25 years to see where we've gone from that monumentality uh, to works that now engage and connect with people uh, who participate with them and have a lot more to say about how they are installed in the space in which they are installed. And they've now taken that form that is the new new dimension of public, which is the cloud and that space that's very ethereal and about us. So uh, a major transition from the monumentality of uh, metal and wood and such as we once knew it to now the more ethereal and the more digital.
Thank you. Thank you. So we'll open it for questions. Andrea, are you uh, giving us the questions? Right. Um, at this moment, I have a question from Denise uh, to the panelist. And she's asking, uh, does art um, have to have a moral purpose? And were the lines not classical before they were British? And is being Greek or Roman better? Um, and maybe they're just lions. I, I guess there's a few questions there. Does anyone want to answer, answer that? We're all being terribly Canadian. <laughs> no one wants to go first. Well, I, I could say from, uh, you know, our, you know I'm, I'm just one person in Squamish Nation, but um, the, re the renaming of place, the, um, the, the movement of our people onto the reserve, the control of our, um, you know, our, our very identity and definition of family by racial purity, um, the renaming of all, like every, every single location, the alienation of us from the land doesn't, doesn't seem like an innocent act. And of course, I love the sculptures. I love seeing sculpture. Um, and, you know, I just, I just want to think it's a coincidence that, you know, every, every, every single piece of our ter uh, territory, we'd been erased from the visual identity. And for a long, long time, um, you know, I, I, still, I still get asked in public when we do public presentations, like, they just don't know who we are. And they, they'll, they'll literally say, well, you, your people didn't even do art or they didn't do good art. You know, they been taught another form of art is, is better or another culture is better. And we went from a estimates range from, you know, 60 to 90,000, just, just Squamish people down to about 120 in my grandfather's time. So we were almost completely gone from the world um, with no sign that we, we'd remained. Um, our artwork was, um, it did, it did actually live in the homes of, of local residents. Uh, people were often uh, just given things, really ancient uh, objects, uh, just, just because we liked them. So people would give someone a basket or give them a stone carving. Um, so our art doesn't seem, doesn't live so much in museums as it just does in the homes of, of local residents, which I kind of like. Well, it's interesting in terms of the question with the lions and, and that type of thing. I mean, for me, I've always, I've really pondered the fact that, uh, you know, European culture has been far more accessible in academic institutions than Indigenous culture. So it's easier to learn, say, Greek and Latin than it is to learn an Indigenous language. And that is colonialism. And we have to acknowledge the fact that the system has made it hard to acquire uh, indigenous languages, indigenous art. And that is something the movement now has to be to, as much as we appreciate the scale of the, say, the lions on the bridge, we have to admit that that is the fallout of not just an erasure of indigenous culture, but the fact is that we've made somehow culture from thousands of years ago and thousands of miles away more meaningful and accessible here. So that, that's my insight about that. And I think that's, that's what we have to change. Yeah, and it, I think it's an, ex, it's an explicit example of that overriding in that the Lionsgate Bridge is named in reference to what mm -hmm. settlers called the lions on top of the mountains on the North Shore, which we now know were the sisters and relate to a, a great story of um, two sisters who brought peace between warring nations. And so that whole, you know, it's a literal overwriting of, of one uh, local story with an imported, um, you know, imagery uh, overlaid on top of it. The next question. Andrea? Yes, um, yes, we have a question from Sharon and um, she's asking, is it possible to use um, I guess the term inappropriate public art um, in some educative way rather than um, only the options of removing or destroying them. Can you repeat that? The first part was uh, my fault a bit. Yeah, there was some sound. Yes, um, Sharon was asking, is it possible to use um, inappropriate public art as she has in, in quotation marks in some educative way rather than the, uh, the only options being the removal or destruction of them. 
I think that's a that's a really interesting and sort of topical, timely question. I think um, one reference point maybe for for some folks who might not be familiar is Monument Lab. It's out of the the University of Phil is it Philadelphia. It's Ken Lum, the the artist who used to live in Vancouver and and Penn State. Penn State, sorry, not Penn State, State. Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, University yeah. of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, where where Ken's at, and and yeah, they're they're doing this national project across the U.S. to document and have these community localized discussions. And I think it's going to be community specific in each context, right? There there shouldn't really be a blanket statement across the country or across a state or province. But but my sense personally is just that. Yeah, using using kind of these these artworks or sculpture or monuments as learning tools is definitely an important and a valid part of it. I mean, I, I come from India where I grew up, and you know, we had a lot of colonial history erased overnight by renaming of cities, by taking down, you know, marble, bronze, brass sculptures and putting them in a museum graveyard where nobody would really go visit them. You know, and and so actually kind of the injury and the harms caused by those people or by those governments was actually erased from memory, which is worse in some cases than, you know, keeping that front and center and keeping that as a reminder of how what not to repeat or what we should kind of constantly being aware of in the back of our minds. I also think that time in, in a way is a very important thing when it comes to, uh, to sculpture. Uh, uh, and, you know, maybe putting things away for a while and then bringing them back out and placing them in context. And of course, I, I always, being part of the Italian Cultural Center, the, you know, we always talk about the Capitoline Museum and the big sculptures there. Well, there were a lot of Roman emperors there that we all admit were not great people. But at this point, we wouldn't consider getting rid of it. However, we do now put it in context. But I think things right now, in many cases, are too, you know, for example, a Columbus statue, that needs to be put away for a while. We need to acknowledge that he was not a good person. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of negotiation with that and we need to reflect on how we present these things thoughtfully. I can share a thought as well. We, um, we have a, a, an event like someone gets a name uh, and we have many witnesses and um, I've been told we're considered like poor people, if we only have our friends and relatives there, so if we don't have a real diverse crowd. We we you know we just repeating stuff we already know, but to have guests from other other nations, um, we say on that day we're rich to have all that uh, diversity of teachings. Uh, it makes us feel rich, and uh, that's what we call otsamiya, uh, the the calling of witnesses. And then, say they pass the name down fifty years later, they'll call back witnesses from the original ceremony. Uh, to verify what took place. And of course, 50 years later, people have very different perspectives on what took place. You know, they have, they have a very different idea of what, it, not only what we intended to do, but what it, what it means to us today. And, um, you know, I can't help but think of, um, you know, friends I had in Montreal. Um, you know, imagine if we came back together around that women's monument and spoke about it today, you know, the, the conversation, um, you know, people know more now. Uh, we'd be talking about you know, missing and murdered indigenous women, we'd be talking about all those little graves they're digging up around schools, mm -hmm. schools, you know, yeah. you know, in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, the, the conversation would be, would be, would be much bigger. And yeah. um, it would, it, it'd be worth doing, I think, to, to, to be, keep having that conversation through time and, and with our changing knowledge and perspective. Mm -hmm. What was the word again? For, for verification, it's tachlinatum. So we would literally, you know, if someone has moved across the country, we'd fly them in, like our family would fly them in to verify what took place. Because uh, sometimes um, we'll share a name with uh, a non-Squamish person. We'll, we'll let them carry a name for their lifetime. But uh, as we own the name, our family might own the name, it would, it, would, it would be given back to us, you know, after being carried around. We'd give it to someone who would like lift, it, lift the name up, like, you know, um, make us feel really proud to have that person carry our name around and enrich us as a family. And then, and then they would pass it back to our people um, with a, a very different, um, very different sense of history around it. 
you know, uh, I, my, oh, my, go ahead. Uh, my idea about uh, monuments is is uh, uh, is one that that I, I appreciate the the complexity of what a monument is, and I think there's a lot of discussion about whether a monument is intended or should be thought of as something to commemorate or remember something in the past. Uh, if it's for the present so that uh, we can learn uh, to understand uh, a better future. So what is the purpose of a monument? I think that's not always clear. And um, I think that uh, more and more uh, cities and, and artists are thinking about something called a non-monument or an unmonument. And the idea of that is less of uh, something that is um, so longstanding, uh, typically uh, understood to have a kind of uh, uh, ability to morph and change and transform. Uh, it, you know, it's not uh, so uh, needing to be a forever a man and a horse uh, in the middle of the plaza, that there is a, a, a sense of, of change inherent in the work itself and that um, it need not be vertical and, and, and prominent and, and, uh, and possessive of the space that way. Um, and I think that that's very interesting to, to really think about other ways of um, understanding the monument as a, as a living thing and um, uh, one that, that is not outside of community, but very much uh, transformed by it and through it uh, in its own lifetime. So uh, I know that's a little bit uh, abstract, but uh, it's very exciting to hear about uh, discussions about monuments in so many areas of study. It, uh, for example, architecture, uh, um, you know, city planning, uh, uh, memory of, of uh, of events. And so, you know, the question of do you tear down the monument of Stalin or do you leave it up so that we can learn from it? Um, you know, I think it's no simple answer to that. Uh, but I think moving forward, thinking about unmonuments is very exciting. Thank you, Ruth. If, if I could speak, I'm on the Women's Monument Committee. Do you mind if we, I, I'd like to go back to something Aaron just said. Uh, Aaron, we've continued to, we hold uh, events there uh, pretty much every December 6th since it's been uh, built and for years now. Uh, and while we were in the process of, of making it, um, the, the project, we've talked about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And, uh, and so Indigenous women uh, that we know that we meet have spoken at the monument and been featured at the monument for years now. So what you're talked about is true and you're right. Like the next, this December 6th will include what's happening on these terrible uh, finding of all these bodies in, in all the residential school areas. So thank you. You're right. And like it's, it changes over time. And certainly this year we are talking about um, battered women and children because of the increase in violence on, during the pandemic. Thank I you. I think that's it, uh, Chris, uh, thank you so much. And I, I, I would say that that's an unmonument. The women's monument is what I would call a living monument that, that, as you say, changes over time, that, 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 that embraces the community and embraces dialogue and uh, does a job that both remembers the past and prepares us for the future. Thank you, Ruth. It's what we intended. We saw violence against women as this juggernaut that's been going on for centuries and we knew it's not stopping but we wanted to create a moment where we acknowledge and the 14 women, it was this huge event at the time, they represent the individual to us, not themselves per se, but the, uh, you know, themselves, yes, but 
but the idea of the, the loss, the personal loss of the individual. And, and it's happening in, in massive numbers. Um, violence against women, it, it, the murder of women, it's increasing worldwide. So it's kind of, it, it, it's a place to gather in the midst of, of reality. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. And is there another question coming up? Or? Um, <clears throat> the questions have been, um, I guess, the, the same, similar topic about what to do with what is viewed as um, troubling sculptures, whether, um, for instance, Marjolaine is asking, could we move these sculptures into museums with appropriate uh, interpretation? Oh, and she did say she, uh, yeah, it's been answered, but I thought <laughs> I just make sure everyone feels that they've been heard. Um, but yeah, I think the, the questions have been along the same lines. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like this, uh, this trend that I've seen in the news where there are three, you know, there are three interpretations of it that you, um, you know, that there's the indigenous interpretation uh, of public art as well. And that is placed alongside the traditional uh, as well, that they, it remains in public, but also there is that um, indigenous interpretation as well too. That is also an alternative. And also it is the function of museums as well to, to deal with um, the interpretation of sculpture. Are there any other questions? Um, no, I think we've answered it. Okay. And, oh, nope, I think someone else. Oh, I guess, okay, Eleanor sent a message. She, um, she's saying that the, uh, the public art that gets taken down because of a, a public resistance or for whatever reason, does it have a place years after like the upside down church? Um, so I don't know. Yeah, that, that makes, uh, yeah. So I guess if it has a place, I suppose, again, I suppose it has a place again in society, possibly, or removed and then replaced. I think Mar, you're you trying to ask that. Mar, do you want to respond to that? Yes, yeah. I think yes. The reference to the the upside down church, which is what it was colloquially called, but the the actual artist title was "Device to Root Out All Evil," and it was down in in Cole Harbor, just between the the condo towers and the green space, just off the seawall. And that was actually one of the temporary installations. I think it was 2005, 2007 Biennale exhibition. And the majority of Biennale artworks, actually all of them start off as temporary. And then really it's a test of time over those two years, you know, how they integrate with the community, how community responds to them. Is there discussion? Are they well received? Are they well loved? Is there support for them? And then they kind of either transition out as temporary or we try to work with you know, groups to secure them permanently and the city to house them as well in those sites. So that one was actually temporary. And it was, yeah, it was definitely one of the ones that generated a lot of discussion just because the form was a prairie church with a steeple and it was kind of pointed upside down with Dennis Oppenheim, this famous land artist, really questioning the role of church in society. And I think there was a comment earlier, or a question earlier about does art have to be moral or is morality a part in that? And I think it definitely can be. I don't know if it should be, but I think it's different artists have, have a perspective on it and if they feel strongly about it. I think our society does allow for that sort of freedom of discussion and thought, which again, with the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei is really talking about censorship in certain societies and communities. And so we do have that freedom and privilege and it's a right and responsibility at the same time to kind of have that opportunity for, for dialogue in a public format. But it would be interesting, given the question, if you were to bring it back today, how would it be received? And sight and sight may play a big role in that. Uh, has society changed or have opinions changed uh, how they might see that? Um, currently, it's installed, and I think it's close to being permanent uh, in the city of Calgary in a new, uh, de a new development in the downtown core. So different communities see it differently, see words differently, respond differently to them. Um, that's all I can say. Um, we have a question um, 
from Miret that asked um, the panel uh, panelists if they could recommend any literature or information that um, would be related to contemporary public art that they could read or um, look into. To go behind me and pick up a bunch of books. Mm -hmm. I'd, uh, go to I'd, the library. I'd just like to say, yeah, um, I mean, there's there's so much. I mean, there's things that people have kind of referred to in the presentation, like Amar's reference to Monument Lab. They have published one catalog of their early projects, and they also have a good archive developing on their website as well as a podcast, and that's really good for for digging into some of these themes. Um, for there's there's really strong work in a local context that we've been um, relying on in the early stages of our research. And one one piece I really like to point out to people if they don't know about it already is from a book called The Land We Are, which is edited by uh, the artist Gabriel Lirondel Hill with Sophie McCall. And the subtitle is Artists and Writers Unsettle the Politics of Reconciliation. And particularly, there's a really great essay uh, by the Stolo uh, scholar Dylan Robinson and his partner, Karen Zients, who's a, a scholar of performance. And it's a walking tour of public art in Vancouver um, around False Creek that discusses the different ways that that work refers to different uses of that site over the years, uh, longer histories of cultural use in an indigenous context, as well as the kind of over celebration in their perspective of, of the, the brief period of, of industrial uh, uses of False Creek. And so it really talks about the relationship between works of landscape architecture and art in understanding the richness of, of that place. And so I highly recommend that, that essay of public art in Vancouver <laughs> and the Civic Infrastructure of Redress by Dylan Robinson and Karen Zions. Thank you. I, I'd like to recommend uh, Adrienne Burke's book, Speaking for a Long Time. She's a uh, local and she um, did three memorials uh, uh, in Vancouver. One of them was the Women's, Moment, Women's Monument and also the, um, you know, different ones I'm trying to remember. Adrian, if you could write in the, the chat here, if you're here, um, because uh, it's, it's a very good book about this top topic. She's an expert on monuments. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of um, the, the reason I was mentioning uh, potlatching um, is that um, the diversity of voices is, uh, is it's pretty impressive. Uh, you'll hear a bunch of different points of view and um, we're, we're left, you know, over time, we start to get a sense of the, you know, the way people are feeling or, or we start to adjust our thoughts. Like, you know, people will say, uh, you know, I was really offended by that. And then I went away and after a year, I thought about it and I realized, you know, I do need to change or I, I have grown, you know, our, our opinions will, will grow over time. Indigenous culture is, uh, is slow, but it lasts a long time. You know, some, some wars we, we fought or some battles we fought with our neighbors took generations to overcome, but the peace has also last for, lasted for generations. Once we finally figured it out, um, you know, everyone moved at once. And uh, that, that is, you know, we owe that to largely to the potlatch system where we, we were obliged to feed even our worst enemies and we would give them gifts. Everyone, everyone was welcome uh, in those ceremonies. We did it over and over and over again, uh, year after year, until we overcame our own our own prejudice, our own um, our own short sightedness, uh, and were able to, um, to to connect with human beings. And our protocols is based around that. So if you're if you're curious about indigenous culture, just just go participate. You know, if there's something happening. Just just go watch. Uh, we've had a number of people. Um, I don't represent my nation. My writing doesn't represent my nation. I'm just one voice amongst my nation. And uh, I listen, you know, people tell me what to do all the time. And I consider their their ideas when I do my work. And I think that's the way it should be. I, I would hate to see a small committee making decisions for all Vancouver on public art. I would love to see um, more people standing in a circle, you know, around a monument and and having those discussions. And I think it, I think it does grow over time. I think mm -hmm. that's what I like about that, that women's monument is that it's, it's not just a it's not just a piece of art. It's not just a memorial. It's a, a, a place where people gather. And I've been to a number of those gatherings and I've seen them happen many times. 
and I've spoken to the people uh, who've who've changed after having been there. So I, I appreciate that you've you've created this space for this ongoing ongoing discussion about something that's as relevant today as when it first went out. And that's um, something uh, we're at the last minute, and um, that actually what you brought up is really interesting. I I um, when in my reading of ancient Greek literature sure they talk about the places like the temple of delphi and these public places and that there is a, a sacred element to public public sculpture public monuments and and that is something and what i'm hearing also in this whole um panel discussion is that there is a largely a con com both community consensus and community reaction and that sculpture should reflect the community and should evolve out of dialogue with the mm -hmm. community and it's interesting because there were a few things that seemed to come out over and over again in these things there was of course the notion of community community discussion but also this sense of weaving that a lot of these public sculptures and paradigms for creating public sculpture had sort of a reference to weaving and even, and this sort of community collaboration that's interwoven together to, to appeal and to re reconcile the different um, uh, part elements of the community and to create a voice. And I thought that was so interesting how this idea of weaving kept coming up over and over again. And there was even the art piece where the weaving um, that Amar talked about was that you had different cultures that artists that were weaving together. And I thought that was really interesting, this idea of recognizing the locale and recognizing the local culture and, and having this constant dialogue. So we're at the, the end and I wanna thank everyone for their participation. Are there any final remarks or anything that you would like to say? I'd like to say thank you to everyone because I learned mm -hmm. a few things tonight. Uh, and. Uh, uh, particularly, Aaron, thank you for your gentle comments mm -hmm. and uh, educational way of opening doors in our minds. Uh, and so, uh, again, lovely uh, meeting you, Beth and Ruth and Eric. Good to see you again. So, uh, uh, I'm from a different. I'm sitting down here in the warmth of Southern California, so it's uh, a different perspective than listening <laughs> as you talk about space yeah. and such. So, uh, but I do want to thank you all for doing that, and thank you, uh, Angela, for inviting us. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. And thank you to our audience for listening. Thanks very much and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Good night. Still there? Andrea, you can end session for all now. <laughs>